You're right, Mary. We've got to have a great show with a million laughs and color and a lot of lights to make it sparkle. And songs, wonderful songs with you out there selling them. Oh, it'll be wonderful. In the that 1930s and 40s, Mickey Rooney was more than just America's favorite teenager. He was America's favorite movie star. Mickey Rooney was big, short maybe in stature, a little shorter, but a big man. Yeah, a big man. Well, goodbye, everybody. Don't worry about me. I might have gotten in a lot of complications in my life, but that was when I was just practically a kid. Now, I see everything much clearer now. And I'm never going to make any more mistakes. He's got the natural built-in ability to uh, to make you believe the character he's playing. All right. Oh, hold it over there, will you, please? Do what you have to do, but wait a minute. Don't make me, don't make me the heavy all the time. Shut up back there, I'm talking. He's basically a nice guy, except he's a, a bastard at the same time. <laughs> now, for the benefit of the latecomers, this is my brother Lester. He's the happy one. Get happy for him, kid. Come on, get happy for him. <laughs> Throughout his career, Mickey's had as many ups and downs as he's had wives, but his talent never left him. He's a genuine Hollywood survivor, a little guy who proved to be a show business giant. All actors and actresses are, are just grown up children, making believe, having fun, portraying, and trying to convey their roles. Come on, dude, just dance, just dance. With Mickey Rooney, everything is the truth. You can hear all kinds of story, and it's true. Some people hate him, and they have reason to. Some people love him, and they have reason to. And some people get awfully angry with him. Well, I think an actor is not on until, he's got, until he has an audience. When were you the greatest actor or actress when you were alive? It's when you were a child. If there was ever a kid who was literally born in a trunk, it was Mickey Rooney. He was born Joe Yule Jr. in Brooklyn, New York on September 23, 1920. His parents, Nell and Joe Sr., were burlesque performers. Nell was a chorus girl, Joe a comedian. About 14 months of age, I crawled out on the stage, unbeknownst to anybody. I had my overalls on, and a little harmonica around my neck, and I had to sneeze, and my father heard it and grabbed me out on the stage. He said, Sonny, because that's what they used to call me, Sonny Yule. Sonny, what are you doing out here? I could feel the spotlights on me and it was like being in my mother's womb from that moment on he felt at home on stage he was so at ease in his first performance that he brought down the house but afterwards joe senior was furious at his son scene stealing until the theater manager offered him an extra five bucks to keep the kid in the show within a month he was working in an act with a song and dance man named sid gold he built me a tailor-made tuxedo and I still have it to this day. In fact, I wear it every once in a while, even today. <laughs> Life in the Yule household wasn't as much fun as being in front of the footlights. Joe Sr. liked drinking and girl chasing more than being a father and husband. He and Nell split up when little Mickey was only three. While Joe went back on the road, mother and son moved to Kansas City to live with Nell's sister. One day, while reading the showbiz paper Variety, Nell saw that movie producer Hal Roach was looking for kids to be in his Our Gang series. She thought her son would be a natural. I think she decided she'd rather put him in show business than me in show business herself. So I think Nell and a couple of girlfriends, they all got into a Model T Ford and drove to the West Coast. Little Mickey did his stuff for an assistant producer at the Roach studio and was offered $5 a day to join Our Gang. Nell turned the offer down, saying the other kids were getting five times as much, and if her son wasn't going to get the same money, Mr. Roach could forget it. It was back to Kansas City. She was a very stubborn lady, and she wanted Mickey to be what he wanted to be, number one, if he could be. Within a year, Nell and Sonny were back in Hollywood, and this time something happened. Joel Yule Jr. would become Mickey Rooney. He had already gotten a few bit parts when an agent tipped off Nell that they were looking for a kid to play the character of Mickey McGuire in a film version of the hit comic strip, Tunerville Folks. Nell knew the role of the tough-talking, cigar-smoking Mickey was tailor-made for her son, even if the character had dark hair and her kid was a blonde. That didn't stop Nell. 
The night before the audition, she dyed his hair. He got the job. He was Mickey McGuire for the next six years, making nearly 80 films before audiences got tired of the series. Yeah, and if he hadn't made his run so fast, we wouldn't have so long to wait for the next one. Come on, we'll walk. He was so identified with the character that Nell wanted to legally change his name to Mickey McGuire. The comic strip's creator said nothing doing. But no one could stop him from using the name Mickey. I tried to get another name for a last name. I thought of all kinds of things. What would go well with Mickey? And finally, uh, Nell remembered that they had a good friend in vaudeville named Pat Rooney, a dancer. So they decided to usurp his last name. As Mickey Rooney, Mickey started getting bit parts and features, working with stars like Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Gene Harlow, and Joel McRae. In between films, he started playing ping pong and tennis and became one of the best young players on the West Coast. In fact, it was ping pong that led to his next big break. He was playing a charity tournament where the referee was producer David O. Selznick. At the time, Selznick was working for his father-in-law, MGM's Louis B. Mayer. And he went to Mayer after the tournament. He says, as a kid, I just saw playing ping pong and he's the greatest actor I've ever seen. He really hams it up and he's playing, and he didn't, but the audience loves it. He says, you ought to sign him up. And uh, Mayer said, oh, that, uh, that's Mickey McGuire. I know him. I really don't want him. But even though Mayer wouldn't sign Mickey, Selznick had a part written for the young actor in his current production, Manhattan Melodrama, starring Clark Gable. At first, the film just did okay at the box office, when suddenly it became world famous as the movie that gangster John Dillinger saw the night the feds gunned him down outside the Biograph Theater in Chicago. The electric chair was again cheated when Dillinger was lured to this north side Chicago theater by the woman in red to see Manhattan Melodrama. As a result of its notoriety, Manhattan Melodrama became a smash hit. And so did Mickey. MGM signed him to a long-term contract. For any young actor in those days, it was a dream come true. By 1934, MGM was already the biggest and classiest studio in Hollywood. They did everything for you. If you had to go to the doctor, there was a doctor on the lot. If you had to have your teeth fixed, they fixed your teeth. That was like walking on a college campus. You could turn to the left and go into ballet school, or turn to the right and go into a class rehearsing a scene. Everything on that lot was to help the actor relax and be productive and, and so on. How is everything up there now, Jimmy? Mm, not so good. I think she's worried. You think who's worried? Miss Evelyn. What's she worried about? You. With each film, Mickey was growing as an actor, if not in height. He was also getting a reputation as a troublemaker. On loan out to Warner Brothers to play Puck in the studio's all-star production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, he almost single-handedly closed down the picture when he broke his leg tobogganing. The film was already too expensive to hold up while Mickey recuperated, so the studio shot around his broken leg by hiding it under an invisible platform. Despite all the problems he caused, Mickey ended up stealing the picture from the likes of Jimmy Cagney, Dick Powell, and Olivia de Havilland. With Mickey's success as Puck, MGM started giving him roles in first-class pictures like Captain's Courageous and Little Lord Fauntleroy, playing opposite one of the biggest child stars of the 30s, Freddie Bartholomew. Oh, why couldn't that copper leave us alone? We had him lit. Thanks terribly for coming to my rescue, Dick. Oh, next, that makes us even for me giving it a bump. <laughs> They didn't even scratch it. Gee, Willikers, where'd you swipe that? Dearest gave it to me. Isn't it magnificent? It's a lot of palooza. Mickey was earning rave reviews with every picture. But it was a series of B films, starting in 1937, that would make him a star. They told the story of a small town family, the Hardy family, and the escapades of their teenage son, Andy. Here we go, into the brand new story, Life Begins for Andy Hardy. Couldn't I have that month and go maybe, say, to New York and get myself a job and find out what life's all about on my own?
My, but this place has poisonous rules. If carried to extremes, it could ruin a man's social life. Today I am a man! The Andy Hardy series became one of MGM's biggest moneymakers, as well as a proving ground for starlets like Lana Turner and Ann Rutherford, who could play Andy's girlfriends. The series also marked the first time Mickey worked with Judy Garland, who would become his best friend, both on screen and off. I think that what people loved about the Andy Hardy pictures was the fact that they could associate with Andy. And the man-to-man -man talks with the judge were philosophy that everybody wanted to hear. Look, Dad, can I talk to you man-to-man? -man? That's the way I always wanted to be. Oh, man-to-man, -man, Dad. Can a guy be in love with two girls at once? Both uh, estimable young ladies. Huh? Oh, well, we just do a little hugging and kissing, Dad. I mean, good, clean fun, just like Polly and me. Object matrimony? Matrimony? Oh, Dad, you don't have to worry. I'm never going to get married, ever. Just as audiences were starting to think of Mickey as the all-American boy, he transformed himself into the toughest, meanest punk anyone had ever seen in the 1938 classic, Boys Town. I'm Father Flanagan. I saw your brother Joe just a little while ago. We had a long talk about you, Whitey. Joe wants you to come to Boys Town with me. If you think you're going to make a plow jockey out of me, you got another thing coming. With his performance in Boys Town, Mickey wasn't just the kid next door anymore. He was an actor. You want a light? Sure, I'm blowing the plant. Go on back, will you, Pee Wee, where you belong? That's a good kid. On your way. Mickey was so believable in all of his roles that he received a special Academy Award for bringing to the screen the spirit and personification of youth. By 1939, Mickey Rooney was the most famous teenager in America and the cockiest kid in Hollywood. By any account, 1939 was the greatest year in Hollywood's history. More classic films were produced that year than any other before or since. The Wizard of Oz, Stagecoach, Gone with the Wind. And the biggest star at the box office? No, not Gable, not Garland or Astaire. It was Mickey Rooney. That year alone, Mickey's films brought in over $30 million for MGM. But Mickey's salary was half of what other stars were making. The studio felt how much money did a 19-year-old need? Rooney should have been uh, a multi-millionaire when he was a kid. He wasn't. As far as I'm concerned, Louis B. Mayer took all his money, put it in his pocket, and treated him beautifully, but Louis had the money, not Rooney. Mickey was hardly suffering. He had a ranch, a 12-room house, a jazz band, a hideaway apartment in Beverly Hills, and a custom-made Lincoln Continental personally given to him by Henry Ford. But even with all those things to keep him busy, Mickey was restless. He was hyper. He still is. He can't sit still a minute. He just couldn't hold him down. If he wasn't singing, he was dancing. If he wasn't dancing and singing, he was writing. If he wasn't writing, he was playing the piano. If he wasn't playing the piano, he was writing music. You know, or playing the drums. I don't know. Name it. He was also getting a reputation as one of Hollywood's biggest swingers. A date with Mickey in those days, as Gloria DeHaven discovered firsthand, could be a dream and a nightmare at the same time. One time we went to the Macambo. Lovely evening. We had a perfect dinner. I mean, we danced. Everything was great. It was just going beautifully. And the check came. And Mickey got the check, and he looked at it for a while. He called the waiter over it very calmly. And at the top of his lungs, he looked at it. He said, for what? <laughs> I went through the floor. Because he was a little devil. He liked to get out. He liked the girls. He liked to play. Loved the horses. Still does. Never get over that. And, of course, that was not an image that Mr. Mayor wanted, you know, necessarily wanted his pride and joy um, young kid to have. Well, we call him into his office and said, Mickey, this isn't the image of Andy Hardy. Uh, we don't like this, and uh, you've got to change your ways. And Mickey said, look, I work hard. I put my guts into everything I do at the studio here when I'm shooting. He said, why do I have to have a... Why, why do I have to behave myself when I'm not at the, in front of the cameras? And, and Louis B. Mayer said, that's the way it's got to be, Mickey. To make sure Mickey behaved himself in public, the studio assigned a publicity man to be with him whenever he went out. 
but he usually couldn't keep up with Mickey. For less, he'd, he'd have to keep saying, has anybody seen Mickey? I had him here, ten, you know, he was here 10 minutes ago. Where, where did he he'd lose him all the time? <laughs> but Mickey's life in the fast lane wasn't affecting his work. His co-stars were astounded by his powers of concentration. In a scene where Mickey was supposed to cry, in the middle of the scene, he would have tears rolling down his cheeks. And you really believe him. And then the director would say, cut, we got to do it over again. And they do it over again. And Mickey would bring on the tears, exactly the same spot. When he worked with an actor, you watch Rooney. His eyes are searching the opponent's eyes or whoever he's playing to. He's one actor that doesn't stop after he reads a line. He listens for the opposing line. For three years in a row, from 1939 to 1941, Mickey was number one at the box office, turning out hits like Huckleberry Finn and Young Tom Edison. To promote Young Tom Edison, Metro Goldwyn Mayer sent Mickey and Louis B. Mayer himself on a whistle-stop tour of important places in the life of the real Edison. On February 9th, 1940, there arrived at Dearborn as guests of Mr. Ford, Mr. Louis B. Mayer of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mrs. Mayer accompanied by the irrepressible Mickey Rooney, star of the photoplay Young Tom Edison. The premiere of this picture had brought them from Hollywood. A short visit at the Edison Institute Museum prefaced an inspection of the Menlo Park Laboratory of Thomas A. Edison. From Menlo Park, the tour headed west, winding up in Port Huron, Michigan, Edison's boyhood home for the film's premiere. With his favorite Andy Hardy co-star, Judy Garland, Mickey appeared in the musical Babes in Arms. Over the next few years, Mickey and Judy would become the biggest song and dance team since Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. She was like my sister. She knew what I was going to say before I said it. And I knew what she was going to say. I loved her with all my heart. There's no day that goes by that I don't think about Judy. He should have married her, he told me once. He said he would have been better off. Because they got along well, but I don't think he appealed to her sexually. I said to him, Mick, you're number one at the box office. You've got bigger ticket sales in Garbo and Gable. What do you want to be when you grow up? He says, oh, I don't know, Sidney, maybe I'll get married one day. He meant every day, right? Well, Mickey and Judy would always be great friends. The first true love of his life was an 18-year-old model from Grabton, North Carolina, named Ava Gardner. Ava had just been signed by MGM when she met Mickey on the set of Babes on Broadway. At the time, Mickey was in full drag as Carmen Miranda. He was still in the outfit when he asked Ava to have dinner with him that night. She turned him down. But Mickey was persistent. He asked her out every day for the next week. And when an MGM executive pointed out that going out with Mickey would be good for her career, Ava finally accepted. Mickey ended their first date by asking Ava to marry him. She thought he was crazy. But they kept going out, and on every date, Mickey would propose. Five months after they first started dating, when Mickey proposed on Christmas Eve, Ava said yes. The fact is that uh, Ava didn't want to marry me, and I didn't blame her, but I wore her down. Studio boss Louis B. Mayer was furious. He didn't want his Auntie Hardy married, figuring it would hurt the series and its wholesome image. Mickey threatened to go to another studio if he didn't get Mayer's blessing. Mayer got the message. He ended up throwing Mickey's bachelor party. And so, on January 10th, 1942, only three weeks after they got engaged, Mickey and Ava were married. She was 19, he was 21. Ava and I would like to thank everybody for their many good wishes, and especially our boss, Mr. Louis B. Mayer. Thank you very much. I think that was a, a big love of his life. But the problem was she didn't want to live the kind of life he wanted to lead. He's a ham. Uh, she wanted to stay home, oddly enough, this glamorous creature. One night, not long after they were married, Mickey went into a jealous rage after seeing Ava dance with another man. Ava decided she had enough. She walked out on Mickey, saying, quote, I'm tired of living with a goddamn midget. Mickey was devastated, and it showed in his work. When studio executives saw the rushes from his latest Andy Hardy picture, they complained that he was beginning to look as old as his father. The studio didn't want their top star down in the dumps, so they orchestrated a reconciliation. For a while, Mickey tried to change his ways. He even gave a much-needed boost to Ava's acting career. 
she was just a starlet at MGM. She was signed up because somebody thought she looked good, not because she could act. She'd never been in a play or anything like that before. She had been a model in the South. And after they got married, uh, Mickey wanted her to get some decent parts, or she wanted some decent parts. They wouldn't give them to her. Uh, she was just one of those women who stood around and looked pretty. So Mickey, Mickey helped coach her. And he, when she finally got a decent role in some, in some picture, he, he stayed up all night and made her all do the lines right and everything. He's very good that way. It wasn't enough to save the marriage. After a day at the races, Mickey and Ava went to a Hollywood restaurant for a late dinner. When Mickey offered to buy drinks for the entire bar, a furious Ava took a cab home and slashed every piece of furniture they had with a kitchen knife. A few days later, she threw Mickey out. They had been married for nine months. He begged her to let him come back, but Ava wanted nothing to do with Mickey. Within a few years, audiences would feel the same way. Following the public breakup of his marriage to Ava Gardner, Mickey Rooney threw himself into his work harder than ever. His performance in the human comedy as a Western Union delivery boy whose life is touched by World War II earned him an Oscar nomination. He was equally good, if not better, as an ex-jockey in National Velvet. Could the pie win the Grand National? Velvet Brown, who do you think you are? Well, I'm the owner of the pie. And does that give you leave to go poking your head out amongst the stars? Believing you could take the richest, grandest prize a horse ever won? National Velvet was the last film Mickey would make for three years. While shooting the picture, he received his army induction notice. The night before he entered the service, he asked Ava to have dinner with him. To his surprise, she said yes. The evening ended with Mickey asking her to marry him again. Ava told him she would wait for him to come home. She didn't. Only a few weeks after Mickey started his basic training in Alabama, the gossip columns were reporting that Ava was now dating Howard Hughes. Less than a month later, it was Mickey's turn to hit the columns. While attending the Birmingham premiere of National Velvet, he met Miss Birmingham of 1944, 17-year-old Betty Jane Reyes. Before the night was over, Mickey proposed to Betty Jane. One week later, they were married. The next week, Mickey shipped out to Europe, where he entertained the troops, often right at the front lines. I was no hero. I just, like all of our men in our, our Jeep shows, uh, we saw a lot of men die. We were lucky not to have been one of them. One of Mickey's happiest moments overseas occurred just a few weeks after he arrived, when he got word that Betty Jane was pregnant. But Mickey wouldn't meet his son, Mickey Jr., until he came back to the States two and a half years later in 1946. With his happy buddies, Sergeant Mickey Rooney's home again. After nearly two years in the Army, the young film star will soon be rejoining MGM. It was a different America that Mickey returned to. An America a little less innocent, a little less naive. His first post-war film, Love Laughs at Andy Hardy, was a box office dud. Audiences just weren't buying Mickey as a kid anymore. You know, Kay, a man could look for the rest of his life for a girl like you. And at the dance, if you give me a chance to say something, well, I have something very special to ask you. The dance will give us a chance to have a long, serious talk about us. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, I can't wait. And in the meantime, we'll always have luncheon together at our same old table and to think there are some people that don't believe in college. The young romantic lead, perhaps the longing for him to do, was a hard thing for Mickey to, to get that. He wouldn't be cast in that role. And those were the roles that were around. Well, when you're short and not good looking, uh, you can't go on playing the Mickey Rooney kind of character any longer. And uh, it's, it's just like a ch most child actors go through what they call the awkward age, and that usually finishes them off. It was very difficult and harder for him than anyone because he loved to work and he had so much in him and so much to give. Mickey was also having problems at home. Like a lot of GIs who quickly got married before shipping out, he really didn't know anything about his wife and soon discovered he had nothing in common with Betty Jane. They stayed together long enough for Betty Jane to become pregnant again, but not long after, she went back home to Birmingham, where she had their second son, Timmy. Around the same time, another relationship ended. With the making of the musical Words and Music in 1948, 
Mickey and MGM parted company. Mickey, when he came back from the war, decided uh, he didn't want them telling him what he wanted to do. He wanted to make more money because he was losing so much money with his alimony that he, that he couldn't get along on 5000 a week, which in those days was a huge salary. Besides, he was a big, big gambler. He used to go to the horse races all the time. And that's where he blew a lot of his money. Despite all of Mickey's own problems, things started looking up when he met actress Martha Vickers in January of 1949. By April, they were engaged. Mickey told a reporter, if this one doesn't last, there's something wrong with me. There's nothing more wrong with him than there's with Elizabeth Taylor. I just don't think he could commit himself to any one person. He really just uh, was just a sexual thing with him. If somebody appealed to him, that was great. But he didn't realize he had to be around the house all the time. He was attracted to all of the women that he married. Um, but if you remember the song, I think it tells it where it, well in, in one phrase. When I'm not near the girl I love, I love the girl I'm near. Martha tried keeping up with Mickey, going out nightclubbing every night. But before long, she had to slow down when she became pregnant. Career-wise, a bright spot occurred when Mickey was asked to be a presenter at the 1950 Academy Awards ceremony. It was to be a big night. But just as Mickey and Martha were getting ready to leave for the show, the Academy called and told him he'd been cut from the ceremony. His personal life, it seemed, was not a good reflection on the motion picture industry. Nobody wants me anymore. Oh, Billy. Oh, I wouldn't say that, dear. I asked every owner over at the track. They were all after me last month. Now nobody wants me. Why don't you give it up, dear? Everybody has to stop racing sooner or later. Maybe this is the time for you to quit. I can't quit, Mom. I can't quit while I'm a failure. For the first time in his life, Mickey wondered if it was time to quit show business. And when Martha agreed with him, he realized it was also time to quit the marriage. On screen and off, Mickey Rooney had hit rock bottom. What kind of chances did you ever take, you phony? Looks like I took one chance too many when I hired a fresh kid to drive for me. Looks like you gotta try and find another driver too, because I'm through, Reno. By the early 1950s, Mickey Rooney's days as America's number one star were a fading memory. You're not mad at me, are you? I'm not mad at you, buddy. With a string of disappointing films and three failed marriages, he was going nowhere fast. But he wasn't the only film star whose future was in question. The entire movie industry was running scared as television took over as the number one entertainment medium. Mickey took the plunge into TV in 1952 and quickly became a frequent guest on variety shows. By 1954, he got his own series on NBC, Hey Mulligan, a sitcom about the trials and tribulations of Mickey Mulligan, a page at NBC. Tell me, uh... uh Mulligan, sir. M-U-L-L-I-G-A-N. Tell me, Mulligan, what were your reasons for selecting True to Life Tim? Well, sir, the reason that I selected True to Life Tim is because it's the only comedy show on the air that makes you cry. It's so true to life that it's sad. Ah, oh, very interesting. Go on. Well, most of the comedies on the air nowadays, they tend to make the people laugh. I believe that the people actually are looking for a comedy show that makes them cry. And the poll agrees with that? Absolutely. TV <laughs> Guide, in its fall preview issue, picked the series as one of the sure hits of the year. But hardly anyone watched. NBC had scheduled the program opposite the CBS hit, The Jackie Gleason Show. But the sponsor, Pillsbury, loved Mickey and was willing to renew the program if Mickey would make personal appearances for them. Mickey said, forget it. He was an actor, not a salesman. Pillsbury dropped the show after one season. He is the kind of a guy that every once in a while he opens his mouth, a shotgun comes out and he shoots his foot. And you're sitting there watching and you think, why did he do this? Why? You don't want him to do it. And, and it frustrates you. You don't want someone that you respect to be disrespectful. Out of work, Mickey had time to pursue his passion for golf. While playing on a driving range, he met former beauty queen and model Elaine Mankin. After going out every night for a month, with Mickey proposing every night, Elaine became the fourth Mrs. Rooney. Happily married, Mickey's career also got back on track. In 1956, he even earned an Oscar nomination for his performance as a GI in The Bold and the Brave. 
but his biggest acting triumph happened on live television in 1957, when he starred, along with Mel Torme, on Playhouse 90 in Rod Serling's The Comedian as a ruthless TV comic who drags down everyone around him. You know who keeps the show together, Lester? Hmm? Have you any idea? The guy sitting right there in that glass. Sammy Hogarth. That's who keeps it together! Here I am, two days away from the biggest comedy show in the history of television. What have I got to work with, huh? A busty dame with a leaky head whose only mission in life is to upstage me. A script that was dug out of the cemetery. Look, I'll, I'll lay you 80 to 1 writers of this minute. We're not in the show. 30 seconds. 30 seconds it falls flat on its duff. Mickey got the role after Milton Berle, Jackie Gleason, and Jerry Lewis had turned the script down. They were afraid everyone would think they were playing themselves. Now listen, everybody. This was pretty rotten. Now let me tell you that right here and now. This was pretty rotten. You walked through this whole thing like a bunch of zombies. I could have gotten more spirit over at Forest Lawn. During the first rehearsals Where's for the show, Mickey proved to be just as much of a challenge to work with as the character he was playing. Mickey would start improvising the script. And I wouldn't know what he was saying. And I recall one day going up to him and said, Mickey, I said, these lines are not in the script. He said, listen, Johnny boy, he said, uh, the only guy, he said, that you say line for line is old Billy Shakespeare. And I said, well, Mickey, I said, I'm a stupid son of a bitch. I said, because I got written at the end of my script, this line here, close up Mickey Rooney. See it? Camera two, close up Mickey Rooney. Unless you say this line, there ain't going to be no close up of Mickey Rooney. He was letter perfect from then on. Mickey's talent became the talk of Hollywood again. Within days, he was besieged with offers. Now he even had enough clout to talk MGM into reviving Andy Hardy one more time with Andy Hardy Comes Home. The movie died at the box office. The wholesomeness of the picture was hard to believe after all the headlines about Mickey's private life. He was still married to Elaine Mankin, but by 1958, the marriage was on the rocks. She just said it was impossible to live with him. He never had any money. He never, he's never paid the bills, and um, people, people would come and take the furniture out while they were sitting there eating dinner. While he and Elaine were still married, Mickey met another beauty contest winner, Barbara Ann Thomason. They quickly became an item, and when Elaine found out, she filed for divorce. By the time the decree was final, Barbara was five months pregnant. She and Mickey got married not long after. A year later, Mickey made headlines once again when he appeared on The Tonight Show with Jack Parr. Mickey had been drinking before the show and became so abusive that Parr kicked him off the air. When he did, the audience cheered. Despite his unpredictable behavior, Mickey was still a pro when he wanted to be. He went on to star in films like Requiem for a Heavyweight and It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. He even landed another TV series, but this time he was up against another hit, The Dick Van Dyke Show. Mickey was what I called dogging him when he found out we weren't getting big ratings. Instead of trying to be good and, and try to beat those two, he just never came in in the morning and he didn't learn his lines and he just was impossible. On the home front, Mickey and his fifth wife, Barbara, had four children by 1964. But Mickey continued to play around on the side. Ironically, it was Barbara who ended up having the affair that tragically ended their marriage. She had gotten involved with Milos Milicevic, an aspiring actor that Mickey brought back to the States after shooting a film with him in Yugoslavia. When Mickey learned of the affair between Milos and Barbara, Barbara asked him to leave. He became so depressed that he had to be hospitalized. Barbara went to visit Mickey in the hospital and was planning to tell him she was going to marry Milos. Instead, she and Mickey reconciled, with Barbara vowing never to see her lover again. When Milos found out, he went into a jealous rage. That night, he killed Barbara, then shot himself. The weapon he used was Mickey's own 38. Once again, Mickey had hit rock bottom. And this time, the odds were he'd never come back. With the tragic murder of his wife, Barbara, and the death of his mother 10 days later, Mickey Rooney stumbled into a drug and alcohol-induced haze. Barbara's best friend, Marge Lane, helped Mickey take care of the kids. Before long, Mickey proposed to her. The marriage lasted 100 days. In June of 1969, he faced yet another tragedy when his lifelong friend and co-star Judy Garland died of an overdose. That same year, Mickey met Carolyn Hockett while playing in a golf tournament. Carolyn soon became wife number seven, but Mickey's finances, or lack of them, 
proved to be too great a strain on the marriage. He was forever hatching wild and crazy get-rich-quick schemes. He said, I'm in town now. I'm starting a new uh, chain of restaurants called Corn Beef and Brew. And we're going to have served just corned beef and cabbage. And it'll be, you'll be waited on by midgets dressed as leprechauns. He said, we haven't had midgets working this much since The Wizard of Oz. It'll be great. Great for the midgets and great for the business. Like nearly all of Mickey's business schemes, it never got off the ground. And by 1974, Carolyn was ready to call it quits, too. She broke the news to him one day on the way home from the airport. All of a sudden, he said, well, gee, dear, this, this doesn't seem like the way home. And she said, no, well, we've got to make one little stop. And we, we went up, he went up with her to the lawyer's office. And he was handed a subpoena. And he said, oh, another one of those? She said, oh, this one's for me, dear. Personally and professionally, Mickey was down and out when an old friend, actor Eddie Bracken, came to his rescue. At the time, Eddie owned the Coconut Grove Theater in Miami and was given a play to star in called Three Goats and a Blanket. And I couldn't do it because uh, I was so busy with all the other things. And I said, besides, this is about alimony, and the perfect guy for that is Mickey Rooney. Let's get him. And on opening night, only 15 people paid to get in to see Mickey Rooney. That's how dead he was. Eddie and his staff went to work publicizing the show. As word of mouth spread, the theater began filling up. Over the next few years, Mickey became known as the king of dinner theaters, due in large part to the efforts of his new agent, Ruth Webb. I, I promoted. I, I, I invented. I got him on the Hollywood squares. I got him on everything I could. I made him what is known as a working actor. By 1978, Mickey was getting movie offers again. Francis Ford Coppola cast him as a veteran horse trainer in The Black Stallion. It turned out to be one of the best performances of Mickey's career, earning him his fourth Oscar nomination. 78 was also a good year for Mickey personally. His son, Mickey Jr., introduced him to a young country and western singer named Jan Chamberlain. Jan soon became the eighth Mrs. Rooney. It was Jan, along with Ruth Webb, who urged Mickey to consider an offer to go to Broadway in Sugar Babies, a show that would take him back full circle to his childhood days in burlesque. Nobody even knew what burlesque was. It had been six decades, and all of the people that did know it had unfortunately passed away. So this was a brand new kind of fun time review, and that's what made it a hit. For the next three years, Mickey made Sugar Babies the hottest ticket on Broadway. He was on a roll. In 1981, while still appearing every night in Sugar Babies, he starred in the TV movie, Bill. The true story of Bill Sachter, a retarded man trying to cope with the world after spending 46 years in an insane asylum. Mickey's remarkable performance won him his first Emmy Award. The following year, he returned to comedy in the sitcom, One of the Boys, co-starring with newcomers Dana Carvey and Nathan Lane. My favorite memory of the whole thing, really, was um, on the day of the taping, um, he would come out and sort of warm up the audience and, and tell a lot of jokes. And someone yelled out um, um, Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, which he had done when he was 14, I believe. And, uh, and he put his, 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 put his, had his head down, and then he brought his head up and he said, if these spirits have offended, think but this and all is mended, that you have slumbered here a while. And he did the entire last speech from Midsummer Night's Dream. And, um, and the audience, you know, got very, very quiet. And then at the end of it, burst into applause. And, and it was sort of symbolic in that one moment of, of, of uh, that this was a career that had spanned 50 years. In April of 1983, Mickey was surprised with a special Academy Award honoring his lifetime in movies. In the next few years, Mickey would star in the Black Stallion TV series, return to Broadway in the Will Rogers Follies, and write his autobiography, Life is Too Short. He's done just about everything you can do in the business, and he's done it well. All around, he's one of the most talented people I think we've ever had. Mickey had every good quality that you can think of. He drank, he gambled, <laughs> he was mean. He was smart. <laughs> when he says no, he means yes, and when he says yes, he means no. You never know what to expect, except that he's an awfully good actor. Look where he is now, what he's doing. I mean, it's 
quite amazing. He's a genius. I really I hate to say it because he'll see this, and I don't want him to know he is. But <laughs> I think he knows it, but he is a genius. You've got to recognize that there will never be another you. It has nothing to do with ego. It happens to be the truth, like two thumbprints. They'll never be the same. There'll never be another you. There'll never be another me. And there'll never be another show like this. 